Welcome. Welcome to the beautiful Visha General Belgrano, which is a nice little pueblo about two hours outside of the city of Cordoba. And uh, we took a bus up here in the mountains. And it's nice and cool up here, which is good. And today we are going to go and check out the town, Visha General Belgrano. We're right here by the uh, train station, or the uh, bus station, rather. You can see, and the interesting thing about this place, if you look at this uh, large cell phone tower <laughs> that's actually painted with the colors of uh, Argentina, the Argentine flag, you'll notice that there are little uh, people, like little people dancing on there, and they look uh, surprisingly very German, and there's a reason for that. The uh, bus station itself, we can walk by it here, try and get across this street without getting run over by a bus. The bus station itself also looks a little bit German in the architecture. Uh, and there's a reason for that. And that's because this is a uh, very, very German village uh, up here in Argentina, which is interesting. I mean, well, it's interesting for me and probably interesting for other people who aren't from Argentina. People who are from Argentina, it's probably just like, yeah, there's, there are a lot of little German villages around Argentina uh, because Argentina actually has a very long history of German immigration. And there are a lot of German villages. The probably most notable one is the city of uh, San Carlos de Bariloche, which is down in the southern part of Argentina. But we're not there. We're actually up here, as you can see in the distance, in the Sierras, the mountains outside of Cordoba, in the central part of the city, or central part of the uh, country. Take a look back at the, the uh, bus station as we leave. We're gonna head down this hill down towards the actual town itself, like the town center. But uh, the interesting thing about this place is uh, it was founded by German settlers, but a large like proportion of the population was uh, are, like descendants. Oh, here we go. As you can see, this is the sign for the bus station. A uh, very German looking man riding a, uh, a keg with a giant beer in his hand. And uh, yeah, so that will give you an idea. That gives you an idea of exactly where we are. I'm gonna try and get across this street without getting run over by a Mercedes, also very German. Yeah, look at this building right over here. Right across is a hotel. It actually has Swiss flags out in front of it, but, uh, you know, Switzerland. It's right next to Germany. They speak German in Switzerland, parts of it. They speak Swiss German. Anyway, getting off topic. So why are we here? We're here because we want to see not only the town itself, but we also want to see a really interesting museum. There's a museum and cultural center. Oh, hey, look at this. It was lovely. Lovely horses over there. Nice pastoral scene. I mean, if you just ignore like all the tour buses over there, but like over here, nice pastoral scene. Beautiful hor horses. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Trying to, <laughs> uh, that's the bus we came in on literally right there. Uh, okay, well, it was a nice pastoral scene until the bus we came in on decided to drive right through it. That's okay, look, we're getting off on a tangent. The reason we're here is because A, we want to see the town, uh, B, we want to talk a little bit about the history of like German, um, German immigration to, uh, to Argentina and why there are so many little German villages around Argentina. And uh, we also want to talk very specifically about some people who settled here in this town in uh, 1939, 1940-ish. And they are uh, very specifically interesting because they're all crew members of a German heavy cruiser, a ship, warship, that was sunk 
in the uh, Rio de la Plata estuary, right by Buenos Aires, right in between like Buenos Aires and Montevideo, Uruguay. And it was sunk in the battle of the Rio de la Plata in World War II. And it's actually the first naval battle of World War II. So if you, I mean, if you're a World War II buff, you probably know about it. If you're not a World War II buff, you probably don't know about it. And you probably don't realize that, yeah, the first naval battle of World War II was fought like right off the coast of Buenos Aires. Uh, it's a very interesting story. We'll talk more about it for sure. Because uh, like the story of how it all developed and then also the story of the battle itself are pretty crazy. And the, uh, the aftermath of the battle, just spoiler alert, is uh, that some of the German sailors who were on one of the, were on the German ship uh, that was involved in the battle, they ended up settling here in this, uh, in this village, which was, uh, you know, founded by German settlers before then, but um, they, they ended up settling here and they and their descendants became a significant part of the population here in uh, the beautiful town of Vicha, General Belgrano. Anyway, we're gonna walk into the center of the town. We'll show you a little bit more. And uh, as we always do in these situations, well, we're gonna try and find a cafe because I want some coffee. And also the museum isn't open for another like hour or so. Uh, there's a museum, of course, to the, uh, you know, like a cultural center museum, but also has a lot of uh, stuff from the, uh, the, like the battle, the battle of Rio de la Plata. And we want to see that stuff. So, this like little, this row of buildings right here, just looks very, very sort of German. I can see German, the colors of the German flag on that banner up there on that balcony. Pretty neat. wild it's like German style architecture with Spanish tile roofs if that doesn't say if that doesn't say everything about where we are right now I don't know I don't know what does yeah look at this stuff and all the signs all the signs for like all the little hotels and the little shops all very German looking have a uh, very relatively German looking stray dog right there. Not getting sidetracked. This place looked kind of interesting, but it's not it's not what we want to see. We want to see the the rest of the uh, the rest of the town here and we want to find a cafe and then we want to go check out that museum because honestly I am kind of like a World War II buff and I am really interested because I, I I even Though I have like learned a lot about World War II, I had no idea about the Battle of the the uh, Rio de la Plata, the Battle of, Battle of the River Plata. Look at this little pedestrian walk through here. Wow, very. Now a lot of this stuff around here is closed. Now we have come. Well, it looks like it's closed. The thing is, is we came here, we're filming on the day before New Year's Eve. So, I think some of these things might be closed. I imagine the like shops, yeah, like this place, food shop, selling all this stuff. These are going to be open. But the stuff like a kinesiologist and physical therapist and occupational therapist, that's probably going to be closed. The kind of office-y, business -y stuff, the uh, dentist's office here orthodontist they're gonna be closed but I feel like the uh, important stuff like the places that sell food and coffee those are gonna be open and I'm hoping that the museum is open too see the thing about this is we did this sort of the way we always do things around here with not a lot of preparation I basically did a little bit of research on the uh, oh you know what I believe we've hit a dead end here. 
Well, let's walk back out. Did a little bit of research on the town and the history. Uh, did absolutely no checking ahead to see if uh, the museum was going to be open, other than just like looking on the Google Maps page and seeing what the hours are. Normal hours, yeah, it's going to be open. Given that it is the day before New Year's Eve, meh, maybe, maybe not. Who knows? We're going to check it out anyway. Either way, if it is open, because it's a Saturday, it's only going to be opened up in the afternoon, like 1 o'clock. And it's about noon right now. So we can walk around the town a little more. We can find a coffee. We can uh, find the actual visitor center, which I've seen pictures of. And it is <laughs> really cool. Very cool looking building. Very German looking. Um, and the thing about these, th these uh, like German villages in Argentina that I have read is that... Uh, they, uh, there are a lot of things about them that, that, that will seem like very um, sort of old German. The architecture, the, uh, you know, to be like older style architecture, the traditions and, and some of the things that they do here, even the language that some of the, uh, the German Argentines speak is sort of like an older form of German because this is like an isolated community that has been a diaspora separated from Germany for so many years that sort of developed on its own, uh, which I always think is super interesting with diasporas. But it is said that you can still hear people speaking German around here. And uh, here we are, like, this looks like a major intersection here. Turn it around and see. There's all these nice shops along here. There is the Fritz Franz little bar over here. Cerveza, cerveza artesanal. So they got nice beer, good beer in there. And oh, down there, okay, let's take a look here. This is actually where they have uh, a Oktoberfest um, celebration here every year. And of course, we are here not in October. If we were here in October, this place, you know, it's, a, it's pretty relatively crowded right now with, uh, with tourists, but man, if we were here in October, oh, this place would be absolutely packed, like packed with, uh, with tourists. But let's just go over real quick and see where they usually hold the Oktoberfest, because I can see the sign at the end of the street here. It says Oktoberfest. And maybe we can take a look. It's probably, I think there's like a little plaza down at the end of the street here where they have, uh, they have Oktoberfest normally. As you can see, lots of car traffic up here. This, uh, this guy working hard, directing traffic. That, I gotta tell you, directing traffic in the middle of a place like this, not at all what I would want to be doing. So, hats off to that gentleman. Doing, he's doing the Lord's work. Yeah, look at this place. Damn. Yeah, this is a cool place. I gotta say, I'm really glad that we hopped on the bus this morning and come out here. That's another thing. I literally had no idea how to get here. I just figured, okay, we go to the bus terminal, there will be a bus to this place. And I was right. There were actually several buses to this place basically what we did when we wanted to get to uh, to Alta Gracia to see uh, the house of uh, Che, Che Guevara. When we did that, same thing. Just like, hey, you know what, we'll just go to the bus terminal. I bet you, I bet you there'll be a, a bus to go where we want to go. People want to go see the house of Che. And same thing, people want to come see this, uh, this little German village. Okay, so right here, Oktoberfest. Or as it is known here, the Fiesta Nacional de la Cerveza, the National Party of Beer. Yeah, National Beer Festival. Man, we should have come here in October. This is a thing. We're gonna have to wait a long time because it's currently, you know, the end of December. So we're gonna have to wait a really long time if we want to come back for Oktoberfest. But you know what? Who knows? You never know what the future's gonna hold, and 
maybe we'll end up back here in October and we'll come here for the National Festival of Beer and get ourselves good and drunk. Who knows? Look at this building. This is the, uh, this is like the, the city hall. Municipalidad, Municipalidad Villa General, General Belgrano. Like the administration building. I mean, look at it. Look at how German that looks. But with the Argentine flags in the window. The Argentine flag out in front. This is a crazy little place we found. I've realized we've gotten very, very sidetracked here. We're walking the opposite direction of the, uh, walking the opposite direction away from the visitor center. Look at this guy. <laughs> Look at this happy dude standing on a keg with his, with his dachshund and uh, his, his beer and his giant mustache. Yeah. This is basically looks like a like a German Disneyland. This is like the Germany part of of uh, Epcot Center, but more authentic because it actually was founded by German settlers. So, you know, and not by like Walt Disney. Visha and Aralba Grano, Oktoberfest, Argentina. So this is where they have Oktoberfest in this plaza right here. I mean, imagine it with. Uh, just absolutely packed, packed to the brim with hammered Argentines drinking beer and trying to sing stuff in German. Man, it honestly would be a lot of fun. I seriously think maybe we should try and come back here in October, but October's a long way away. We missed it by uh, just a couple of months here. It's much more peaceful now. Than, uh, than it would be in October, I imagine. All right, you know what? We've gotten sidetracked long enough. Ambulance just tried to roll through here, man. Whew. Imagine having to be an ambulance driver driving through this place with these narrow streets, so much traffic. Anyway, out in the distance there, we're at the, uh, back at the edge of the plaza here. You can see our, our friend there directing traffic again, same place, but out there in the distance, that spire, that is, I believe, the uh, the visitor's center. So let's go walk over there, one, because I want to see like if they got anything good inside, but also because I want to see the building. I mean, look at it. From back here, you can see how crazy that building looks, and uh, I want to see it up close. So. It really is crazy walking around this place because you know, like I said, it's 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 got uh, German style architecture mixed with Spanish style architecture, and uh, but you know it kind of looks like Epcot Center. It's very very like touristy, but but I know that they didn't just plop this place down as like specifically a tourist trap. It has a whole history. It really was founded by German settlers. You know so. While a lot of this does look a little almost like manufactured you know, to look German, and I'm sure a lot of it was, you know, because it is a tourist attraction. But I mean, just knowing that the history is there behind it is kind of cool. And we'll talk more about the history, but for now I just kind of want to walk around and get a look at, you know, just get a feel for, for the town. This place looks awesome. Wolfie. Nice restaurant with like outdoor seating, very nice. Hey, and there's Wolfie himself and his Fraulein. Wow. And there we go. Little shop right over there. Almacen Gourmet, German Gourmet. So that must be like German food they sell here. These are, you know, German restaurants, I would imagine. And we're gonna get some good German food. That's, that's, okay, that's, we're gonna put that on the list. We are gonna get some coffee. We are gonna go visit that museum I was talking about. And uh, we're also gonna try and get some German food. Maybe we can get like a giant pork knuckle or something. That'd be fun. Pork knuckle and a big beer. 
So we have till, uh, like I said, it's just the afternoon right now. The museum opens at one, and uh, our return bus ticket is for uh, six thirty. So we got plenty of time, plenty of time to explore, take a look around. Oh, and here we are. So this is the visitor center I was telling you about. The gigantic, crazy German-inspired visitor center. Now, the thing about this is, like, like I said, because this actually was founded by German settlers, and there's a lot of history, I don't know exactly what here is, like, actual old historical building that was built by the German settlers before this became a huge tourist attraction, and then, like, what, you know, is just touristy stuff that was built recently and made to look like German tourist attraction stuff. Who knows? I'm trying to back up a little bit here get out of everybody's way I mean look at this thing I'm hoping that this thing was built you know before it looks a little bit older I'm gonna go ahead and say even before I know for sure that uh, this thing was built before just so as not to leave you all in suspense this is what is inside that big building the visitor center it's like a theater with a stage and uh, these little kiosks except it's all closed up nothing's going on all the chairs are stacked over there in the corner uh, yeah I don't know maybe they have like sh I imagine they have shows and performances and stuff in here probably like German music and maybe some like dancing Argentines love to dance so I'm sure there's some sort of dancing going on they have these lights strung across it's really cool in here, but yeah, there's nothing going on right now, so I think uh, now's the time that we go, we go like uh, back out into the town part and we find ourselves a cafe. I know I noticed like, right across the street from this place, there was what looked like a collection of restaurants and I'm imagining there's a cafe in one of them. Somewhere along this street, there's got to be. I mean, look at this. Right across there. That looks very cafe-like. Up this way. It's got to be a cafe. All right, we're going to go find one. And uh, also try and find a little quiet spot. I mean, that's going to be harder and harder to find. There are a lot of people around here. Uh, but we'll find a little quiet spot to sort of hang out and talk more about the Battle of the Rio, Rio de la Plata. The Battle of the River Plata, the first naval battle in all of World War II. All right, cafe, here we go. to the museum it's up here at the top of this hill check out this view from the top of the hill look at this the Sun has come out the clouds have parted and it's uh, it's getting sunny now which is beautiful beautiful blue sky the mountains out there very very beautiful I can tell why uh, German settlers wanted to settle here. It's not a bad place to settle. Before we go into the museum though, I've spied a lovely bench. Ah, look at that bench. Nice bench next to a rock in the shade. We can sit down and we can talk finally about the Battle of the River Plate or River Plate, Rio de la Plata. So when World War II kicked off, September 1st, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland, there was already a German heavy cruiser called the Admiral Graf Spee. Uh, it was already in the Atlantic. They had sort of uh, anticipated that they were going to start a war, and the Graf Spee 
uh, Admiral Grafsby's mission was to, you know, interdict uh, merchant ships shipping stuff from the Americas over to Europe. And for a few months, the, they were very successful at their mission. Um, they sank nine merchant ships. The uh, captain, Hans uh, Lang Langsdorf, he uh, was rather successful in sinking merchant ships and also uh, apparently not... Uh, not uh, so bad of a guy because he actually made sure to take the merchant crew of all the merchant ships on board his own ship before he sank them. So he sank uh, nine merchant ships without uh, any loss of life, which is interesting and kind of gentlemanly of him. Um, but nonetheless, he had sank a bunch of merchant ships, so much so that uh, the British, uh, they put together a like a naval task force in order to uh, to specifically interdict um, that that one ship, the Admiral Graf Spree. Graf Spee. Anyway, so he had bounced all over the, the Atlantic, um, sinking merchant ships, actually sailed around the southern tip of Africa and sank a couple of ships over in the Indian Ocean and then had sailed back. The, the British um, had a pretty good idea of where he where he was going to be and they thought that he would end up down in South America off the coast of Argentina because that's where the shipping lanes there was the most traffic so it's a place where he would be able to do like the most damage in one specific place and they were right and uh, the Commodore of the you know commander of the task force that was sent to hunt him uh, I believe Henry Harwood uh, he was in command of three ships, uh, a heavy cruiser, the Exeter, and two light cruisers, the Ajax and the Achilles. So here's the difference between the British force and the single uh, German ship. The German ship, this is, this is kind of the story for the Germans throughout World War II, but the German ship was top of the line technologically, very advanced. Uh, it ran on diesel fuel, which was very new at the time. Most uh, ships in, in fleets were running on, um, still on coal, steam, steam engines. Uh, it had welded um, uh, armor instead of riveted armor, which was also um, a, new, a new technology. So highly technologically advanced. Bigger, faster, had bigger guns, 11-inch guns, uh, in comparison to the 8-inch guns that the British ships in the task force had. So just outclassed them in pretty much every way, but there was only one of them. And, uh, or at least in this battle, there were two others of the same class made, um, but they were off doing other things. So in this battle there was one, one on three, and this is, like I said, the story of the Germans in World War II. They made things that were highly technologically advanced that they couldn't really make very many of and the uh, allies the british um, especially the british navy they just had so so many ships that they were able to outnumber the germans uh, massively in the naval battles uh, on on land uh, the germans built you know really highly advanced tanks but they couldn't build very many of them and the Russians and the Americans just churned out as many, you know, moderately okay tanks as they could. Um, and we all know how World War II ended, so we all know how that worked out for the Germans. But um, this battle actually reminds me a lot of a future battle, much more famous, the German battleship Bismarck, which was also at the time this massively technologically advanced, bigger, stronger, faster, bigger guns, um, you know, outgunned absolutely everything on the sea um, and was ultimately destroyed the same way as the uh, Admiral Graf Spee was. And when this ship, like I said, was first commissioned, it was very technologically advanced. Um, but in this battle, specifically in this battle, it was uh, in a very poor strategic position. In that, they were you know, all the way over off the coast of Argentina by themselves having to fight against three British ships, even though they were, you know, they outgunned those British ships. The British also had the home fleet and a lot of other ships 
in the Atlantic Ocean. So essentially, the Germans, uh, their navy was much smaller than the British. They didn't have a lot of ships out in the Atlantic. And all the, the British needed to do in this battle was to damage the Graf Spree enough that it would have to um, try and make its way back to Germany. So essentially, if they damaged it enough that it wouldn't be able to make its way back to Germany and have to fight its way back across the Atlantic Ocean and fight its way, you know, all the way back to Germany, past all of the other British ships, then they, they won the battle. Now, the Germans, in order to win the battle, would have to destroy or disable all three of those ships, uh, the British ships, as well as any reinforcements that were going to show up. So, strategically, they were actually quite outmatched, the Germans, um, in this battle. At the beginning of the battle, Langsdorf and the Graf Spee were already sort of at the strategic disadvantage, but they also were at a tactical disadvantage because they um, mistakenly identified the two light cruisers, Ajax and Achilles, as destroyers. They thought that they were destroyers, which are smaller than cruisers, that were guarding um, a merchant convoy, which is a big juicy target, but they were, you know, basically their mission was to go after merchant convoys. So they sailed in, and by the time they were close enough to realize that they weren't destroyers, that they were two light cruisers accompanied by a heavy cruiser, they were basically already in the fight, and they had to commit. And the second uh, kind of tactical mistake that um, Langsdorf and the, the Graf Spee made was they could have stayed out of range because they had the bigger guns, longer range, and they could have ranged um, and fired, you know, constantly trying to stay out of range of the British guns, but they didn't because Langsdorf's decision was because he had a diesel engines and uh, the British all had steam engines, it would take the British time to stoke the fires and, uh, and get their engines up to full speed. And his thought was he could get in quickly and destroy or disable them before they were able to do that. Uh, unfortunately for him and the Graf Spee, he was not able to do that. And the British had actually uh, planned for this specific um, encounter, this type of encounter, an encounter of British ships that were slower and outgunned by a German ship. Uh, and the reason they had started planning for it was because... Oh, there's a spider crawling on me. Anyway, the reason they had started planning for it was because the during the coronation of uh, King George VI, the, there was a naval uh, review, basically. A bunch of navies from different countries put forth a ship or two and sailed them past so that the, you know, the king could see them all. It's a thing that they did back then, I guess. And the Graf Spee was the ship that they sailed. So the British already knew about it. They knew about its capabilities and they had planned specifically for it. And the plan was basically um, attack it head on with multiple ships from both sides so that the Graf Spee would have to split its fire between the different ships and couldn't focus um, on one ship specifically. Constantly stay moving and uh, an attempt to hit it from different sides. And that's what they did. And there were uh, the Exeter, the, lo the heavy cruiser, took significant damage. The Achilles and the Ajax also took damage, not as significant as the Exeter. Uh, but the Exeter got one very lucky shot in. And the round that it fired penetrated the hull of the Graf Spee and critically damaged their fuel system to a point where they really were only going to have like 16 hours worth of fuel left, which is not enough fuel for them to continue fighting. It's not enough fuel for them to get back across uh, the Atlantic without any kind of significant repairs to the fuel system. So even though the... The Exeter, or the Exeter was severely damaged, the Ajax and the Achilles were damaged, and the Graf Spee was only really sort of minorly damaged other than that fuel system damage. That was it for him. It was, the, that ship was doomed, basically. There's no friendly ports around there. The only port they could find to, uh, uh, to let, drop anchor was in either Argentina or Uruguay, both of which were neutral countries. So they dropped anchor in Montevideo, Uruguay, in the port. 
And here's where things get actually kind of interesting because uh, at that point, it's a neutral country and there are rules in the Hague Convention of how navies um, can interact with, uh, with neutral countries and neutral ports. And one of the things is they're not allowed to stay in a port more than uh, like 24 hours. They're also uh, not allowed to leave the port um, unless uh, if, if a merchant ship of the enemy navy has sailed from that port within the past 24 hours, they're not allowed to leave that port because they didn't want ships sitting in port, neutral ports, just waiting for merchant ships of their enemies to leave and then go after them out in the sea. So the British actually took this to their advantage and they started scheduling merchant ships to leave the port in less than 24 hour intervals, like 22 hours or so. Um, even if even if they uh, weren't fully loaded or weren't scheduled to leave. So basically they pinned, because of the rules of the Hague Convention, they pinned the Graf Spee in port. And uh, at the same time, the um, British diplomats pressured the Ur Uruguayan government to uh, communicate to the Graf Spee that they would only be able to stay in port for 72 hours. So they were essentially... Um, keeping them in port practically by shipping you know merchant ships out and then they also the British um, were essentially trying to rush the decision process that Captain Langsdorff would have to make about whether he would try to leave the port would he try and fight would he try and run like basically putting him in a dilemma with no good options additionally the British um, they sent all kinds of like false uh, radio communications on frequencies that they knew that uh, the um, that the Germans were monitoring, and they sent communications uh, to the effect that um, that there was a huge flotilla of reinforcements coming from the British, and they had the the ships um, that were already there, the Ajax and the Achilles, along with a third ship, the Cumberland, that had actually um, shown up, another heavy cruiser. They had them sit just outside of uh, the three mile range of the, of the, um, the port and, and make smoke, essentially, like, like burn their engines to make smoke, so that the, it made it look, essentially, like there was a larger force out there than there really was. And because of all of this, uh, Langsdorff decided that uh, they weren't going to be able to make it out. They weren't going to be able to make it back to Germany. And he decided to scuttle the ship. So he moved the ship out into the uh, estuary of the Rio de la Plata and he scuttled it. And it's actually still there today. They've raised parts of it, but the majority of it is still there. It's been sinking into the sand at the bottom of the estuary. Apparently you can still see the mast sticking out. Um, so I guess if you're really adventurous, you could get on a boat and go like out just off the coast of Uruguay and Argentina and see the mast of this thing sticking out. But uh, that was it. That was the end of the, uh, the Admiral Graf Spee. Of course, the story doesn't end there. Um, Three days after the sinking, uh, Langsdorff uh, unalived himself, and uh, at his funeral, actually, there were uh, British um, sailors and commanders that, that were at his funeral in Uruguay um, because of, I guess, how much of a gentleman he was and how much they respected him for his uh, naval prowess. And probably also for like not killing all those merchant sailors and allowing them to, you know, come aboard his ship and live, um, even though he sank their ships. Uh, so all of those British merchant sailors, by the way, were all released uh, back into uh, into Uruguay and then repatriated back to the United Kingdom, back to Britain. Whereas the uh, sailors of the Graf Spee, and there were many, many of them, um, they had to figure out what to do with them. And some of them were interned in, um, in Uruguay. Some of them ended up in Argentina. And I believe under the, the Hague Convention, the you know, rules of war, essentially, 
if your ship is sank and you're in a neutral country, a neutral port, you can't actually be repatriated back to your country until after the war is over. So they, they were sort of stuck, and 130 of them decided to, uh, or were, were sent to Argentina, and they ended up here in beautiful Villa General Belgrano, which, like I said, was already a German settlement. So they sort of felt right at home here. So that's actually how you end up with um, the descendants of a bunch of German sailors from World War II living here in Argentina. So that's the story of the Battle of the Rio de la Plata, the River Plate, and uh, it's a pretty crazy story. That's the first battle of a uh, naval battle of World War II. Didn't happen in Europe. It didn't happen, um, you know, in the Mediterranean. It happened right here off the coast of, uh, of Argentina. And if we get up here, you can see right over here, this is a monument. A monument to Panzerschiff Admiral Graf Spee. Panzerschiff means uh, armored ship. And there it is, Captain Zursi und Kommandant Hans. Langsdorf, and then these are also the uh, sailors who died. I believe there were 36 of them that died. And you can see the, I guess this is the insignia of the Graf Spee. You can see the, uh, the cross, which is the uh, insignia of the German military. And this is the, I don't know if this is the actual anchor. I think this might just be like, like an anchor. This, this looks like it's much, much too small to be an anchor for a ship that size. So maybe it is. What do these things say? Uh, I don't think it is. I don't think this is the actual anchor. But there it is. The Graf Spee, Admiral Graf Spee, and there's the monument. All right, so this, by the way, is all outside the museum. We haven't actually gone in the museum yet. Um, so I do want to pay the uh, entrance fee and go into the museum and see what they have there. You can see the museum is just this uh, it's a pretty small, modest building right here up on top of the hill. But uh, let's go in there. Let's go in and see what we can see, and we'll make sure that we can film in there, and then uh, we'll... We'll film and we'll we'll get to get a look at what's inside the museum. All right, so a bit of a setback. I went to try and go into the museum and the doors are locked. So I figured, hmm, maybe they just uh, are opening a little late. So I called their number and the phone rang and rang and I actually heard the phone ring inside the building as well, which means they are actually closed today. So. Uh, we may have taken a two-hour bus trip for, well, not nothing, because we got to see the town, uh, and we got to see the monument out here, and we got to talk about the uh, very interesting uh, battle of the Rio de la Plata. So it's disappointing. Disappointing that the museum wasn't open. Maybe. Maybe we'll get back here someday, and maybe we'll be able to go into that museum, but I remember now that we added something else to our list of missions, and that was... We wanted to find some German food. And I think we might go back to that uh, Fritz and Franz or whatever it was, beer house. I'm sure there's German food there. And I'm sure there's German food in a bunch of restaurants down here. And we're gonna add another thing since we struck out at the museum. We're gonna add another uh, mission to our list of missions. And that is day drinking. Hooray! Okay, so we're gonna go get some German food. We're gonna do some day drinking, and uh, yeah, I'll check in with you. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what else we're gonna do. It's like two o'clock in the afternoon, and our uh, bus doesn't leave back to uh, to the city until like six thirty. So uh, I don't know. I feel like I feel like day drinking is in order at this point. I feel like. That's kind of what we have to do, right? I mean, otherwise it's just going to be sitting down here 
you know, with a bunch of tourists. I mean, which I'm going to be doing anyway. But if I'm going to be doing that anyway, I kind of want to be a little drunk. So, uh, day drinking it is. Yeah.